So why don't we begin um, the discussion with Professor Walsh. If Professor Walsh, if you wouldn't mind giving us uh, your reflections on, on decoloniality, um, you know, in the theoretical and practical context. Um, and also why, do you, why today um, do you feel that it's such an important and timely issue? Well, thank you, Victor, for the questions. Um, thank you for, to Carl and to Roger for the organization of this. And it's a great pleasure to be part of a conversation with Tink, with Fernando, and also with Walter, who we've been in conversation now for close to 25 years. <laughs> uh, so my reflections, I guess, will start um, from my own perspective, let's say my situated, embodied, grounded perspective of decoloniality. Someone mentioned, I think Carl mentioned in the beginning, then in the previous session, different perspectives of decoloniality have been floating. So I'll share some of mine and some that Walter and I sort of wove together in the book, but thinking now from my perspective. I guess maybe a, a beginning way to simply say what decoloniality is, is a kind of posture, an attitude, and an action. And I think that the intertwine of those three is particularly central, and I'll explain a bit later why. So if this posture and attitude and action began with the invasion of the crown and the, and, and the cross uh, more than 500 years ago. So it had a particular beginning um, in 1492, and it had a particular place, a territory, a land, um, which we call Avayala, or some continue to name as Latin America and also the Caribbean or the Americas in a broad sense. So decoloniality in that sense points to a kind of resistance and refusal, an insurgence and a resurgence, but also a re-existence, how to exist despite, against refusing this order that began with the colonial invasion. And as I'll explain, has taken on new and different forms, right? So it's against, decoloniality is against colonial domination, but it's also for. So it's not just resistance or a posture of resistance, but it's for the ongoing creation of ways of thinking, of ways of knowing, of ways of sensing, being, and living outside coloniality, outside or despite coloniality, and in its borders, its fissures, and its cracks. So in that sense, decoloniality necessarily brings forth or points to the issue of coloniality. The two necessarily go together and began together. Uh, so maybe saying a, a, just a little bit about what coloniality is will help sort of define the concept that we have on the table. Uh, if we think of it as a kind of matrix of power, and that's something that we write about, Walter and I, in the book, a matrix of Western Eurocentered power that's based primarily on the ideas of race, but also the idea of gender, sort of, and that coming together that we can talk more about later, but also the use of these ideas to control subjectivity, intersubjectivity, labor, authority, knowledge, but also spirituality and nature, which sometimes often aren't talked about when we talk about decoloniality in a, in a general theoretical sense. Yeah. So if we say that coloniality began in Avayala and then traveled the globe, it gave origin to a kind of what we might term Western modernity and to Western rationality and to patterns of power that are constitutive of, on, of the ongoing and systemic structures of racism, of capitalism, of heteropatriarchy, of Christianity, of anthropocentrism, of expropriation and dispossession, all intertwined. So in that sense, the structures and patterns of power 
that operate are not just those of the past, but in fact were constitutive of the formation of modern nation states and what we might call the corporatization of states today. Um, states that are obviously based on capital, on, on transnational alliances, but also on liberal, neoliberal, and even progressive forms, which is something that we've lived recently in recent years in Latin America. Yeah. But it's also based in social institutions, including in universities and schools. And in it is sort of functions as a kind of assumed authority over land, over resources and over life. So in that sense, decoloniality, at least as I understand it, is rooted in a living memory and a living reality or a lived reality. And in the recognition and refusal and the continuing configurations and mutations of colonial power, right? So decoloniality is not a lineal point of arrival, right? The, the, de the decolonized have come to, <laughs> to leave coloniality, to leave colonial power and become decolonized. It's not linear. It's not a done deal, nor is it a kind of dogma or paradigma. <laughs> Yeah. or a new replacement word for critical. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. It's also not a term that necessarily collapses all forms of colonialism into, into one. In other words, it necessarily recognizes the differences of settler, settler colonialism, of external colonialism, of internal colonialism, and all the ways those mesh, mesh together in this specific context. Yeah. So in that sense, you, we might say that decoloniality is a concept, it's an analytic, but it's also, which is particularly key for me, a form of praxis, which is increasingly assumed by social movements, by communities, by engaged intellectuals, by artists, by activists, and many, many others against the ongoing violences, dispossession, and war altogether. Um, waged against specific bodies, eh, against peoples, cultures, knowledges, spiritualities, and against nature. And four, the insurgent and resurgent creation, construction, and possibility of other modes of thought, knowledge, being, existence, and life. So in that sense, and following sort of the second, the second um, a part of the question that you asked, Victor, what does it mean in both a theoretical and a practical context, right? I think one of the things that makes this book unique is that Walter and I wrote it in two parts, each with our own voice and each in a sense with our own particular ways of understanding, thinking and practicing the inter interdependence and continuous movement of decolonial theory as praxis and as decolonial praxis as theory. In other words, theorizing praxis, right? So for me, the decolonial took form first in concrete practical contexts, not in an academic or theoretical sense. It, it sort of, be, I began to think about the decolonial with my first reading of Franz Fanon in 1971, not in a university or not in a university classroom, but in a study group organized in 1971 by the Black Panthers, and which I was invited to be a part of. So reading Fanon with the Panthers, with members of the Panthers, is a very different context of beginning to understand the notion of the colonial and decolonial than it is to read it in a classroom or in, in a theoretical environment. The second piece of history, which Walter knows, but the rest of you may not, um, is that for 16 years, I lived in and worked with Boricua or Puerto Rican communities in the United States. And it was in that context of everyday life, of education-based work, and of shared battles, including with the Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund, against the still colonial, still colonial reality of Puerto Ricans in the US, that gave me another sense of the decolonial of decolonial struggle, and of how to see systemic racism in a context of education and the legal system, but also in the concrete practice of everyday lives, and how race along with gender, language, knowledge, and existence-based ways of being in the world are constitutive parts of what we understand or call the colonial matrix of power. <laughs> 
uh, so confronting this and working against it and also assuming a kind of responsibility to work against it is part of a praxis that helps me begin to theorize then what decoloniality could be. Um, in the last more than 25 years, I've lived in Ecuador, Latin America, Avayal. And here, based on, uh, which even began before that, the indigenous movement, which is known in the 90s as the strongest indigenous movement in the region, uh, invited me, asked me, uh, petitioned me to accompany on certain tasks. And one of these was towards their building of a political, what they call the political and epistemic movement, political and epistemic. And so it was in that context of learning with the movement and then the tasks that the movement gave me and the tasks that later the black movement here also gave me that I began to learn, to unlearn, to relearn other notions of how we carry the colonial in our body and what it means to assume a kind of decolonial responsibility which I, what is, I, I understand as decoloniality as praxis, right? So in that sense, and in part, in what both movements asked me to put in practice in the university in work has been part of my bringing together of the theoretical and the praxis-based notion or practical-based notion of decoloniality. In a very concrete sense, and we can talk about this more later in the question and answer period, it is over, 20 years ago, uh, we began here in Ecuador, and Walter has been part of that, a, a doctoral program that intends to work through not a decolonial program because that goes against, to, it's not to institutionalize decoloniality, but rather to begin uh, to think about how we begin to fissure or crack the colonial matrix of power that exists in universities and begin to create other ways of learning, of knowing, of thinking, of sensing, of being, of doing that are interconnected. Um, so in terms of the last point to your, in terms of time to think about closing, um, what does this mean in, in today, right? What is this sort of the timely, uh, uh, important issue of how decoloniality makes sense today. I guess I would say in the beginning, it's important to think that coloniality never ends. It's not something of the past that, that we're resurrecting, but coloniality continues to configure, to mutate, to reconstruct its matrices of power. And beginning to name that is extremely complex. It's not sufficient to say the system right, or the colonial system, but we need to be more specific about what we're really talking about. So I think about concretely some of those configurations today taking place of the militarization, the policing, the profiling, the surveillance that happens in cities on the land and in the virtual sphere as well, as well as listening to our Zoom conferences. <laughs> uh, the various forms of extractivism, of extractivist economies taking place, including those that include extracting knowledges, right? And how those have advanced in these times of COVID, particularly in the global south, but I presume as well in that territory of the north of Turtle Island. Uh, we can think about the recanonization of knowledges and the growing dehumanities of universities, where technified knowledges or technological knowledges, what important in the social sciences, uh, uh, are increasingly uh, made silent, uh, eliminated, uh, and the controls that exist in universities today. But also, what I think is particularly key is the targeted de existence. Uh, a de-existence present and taking form in racialized and genderized and heteronormative and territorialized and generational forms, particularly with relationship to COVID. And so how certain populations, certain peoples, certain ways of being need to be eliminated and are being eliminated. I think about here what's going on in South America of the almost 50 indigenous black and peasant leaders assassinated in Colombia in just the last three months. Part of an ongoing pattern, but how it's increasing and how COVID is enabling that to happen. 
I think of the strategies by states and allied forces to attack and kill children in Native communities. It's the new strategy. Let's eliminate the children, the future generations. And that's happening in Argentina, in Chile, in Peru, Bolivia, and Ecuador, in Colombia, as well as Mexico, as well as elsewhere. But I also think about the elimination of Black youth in cities here, here of the levels of feminicides, trans sides and gendered violence, including the trafficking of, of young girls, and of the well-planned destruction of the Amazon that's taking place, of the devastating levels of extractivism, of expropriation, of dispossession, dispossession of land and life, and the connections that it makes with struggles elsewhere. I think of also the globalizing movements of Black Lives Matter and Land Back, and how they also exist here in different ways, uh, but also about the globalization of strategies to fragment, rupture, and divide movements and struggles. I think about the importance and the timeliness of decoloniality that I think could not be more clear. Uh, it's about today, for me, the struggle and survival. Uh, struggle and survival, but also about the possibilities of existence otherwise, existence in and making cracks, decolonial cracks in this, what seems like a totalizing system of coloniality. It's about planting hope where there's hopelessness. Uh, and it's about the crucial work to be done. Uh, work to be done, including, but not only, in and on the land, on territory, but also in and on social institutions, particularly universities and schools. And it's about the praxistic significance of thinking and acting with, right? And what all that means in the different contexts that, that we are, how to connect across territories, across lands, across peoples, across struggles, not to collapse, to understand the differences, but to think and act with. Yeah. How, and I use a lot the questions of the hows, because I think they point to not just what is decoloniality, but how to practice, how to put into praxis a decolonial uh, posture, attitude, action. How to name, how to analyze the matrix of power present and taking form today and how to resist, how to refuse, how to insurge and resurge, and how to re-exist re in these present times. How, as many peoples here in Avayala argue, how to sow and cultivate life where there's death. These, I think, are only some of the crucial decolonial questions of these times of make us, that help us see that decoloniality is not a condition or a presence of the past, but it's this continuing struggle today that begins to bring us together in some ways to analyze the realities that we're living in, but most of all, to assume a praxis, not just against this coloniality or colonial matrix of power, but for the possibilities of living, of thinking, of being, of sensing otherwise. So for time reasons, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was just uh, beautifully said. It was lyrical. 